Excavation and Trenching Safety, Section 25. Excavation and Trenching Safety. References for this section include EM385, TAC1, TAC1, Section 25, 29 CFR 1926.650, Subpart P, UFGS 013529, Latest Edition, The Manufacturer's Recommendations, and Accident Abstracts. Potential contractor mishap outcomes include cave-ins, fires, explosions, electrocutions, and engulfment due to utility hits, struck by falling objects, falls and equipment rollovers, asphyxiation, toxic exposures, and explosions due to hazardous atmospheres. All of these can lead to property damage, injury, or death. This is an example of a trenching tragedy that occurred. The workers had a false sense of security. They knew they were out of compliance. They thought the soil was stable, but conditions changed overnight and a worker died. Trenching statistics, about 400 US workers die in trenching related accidents each year and about 6,400 are seriously injured. What is a trench? It is an excavation that is narrow in relation to its length, and in general, the depth is greater than the width. The width is not greater than 15 feet. What is a cave-in? Soil or rock that suddenly falls or slides into an excavation. Sufficient quantity to entrap, bury, injure, or immobilize workers. Soil gravitates downward. Pressure pushes the soil inward towards the trench. The bottom third of the wall typically fails first. Soil above the collapsed lower wall then follows. Cave-in injuries. Soil weighs approximately 125 pounds per cubic foot. A worker can be crushed by the soil, rock, or an object. Suffocation. Even if the worker's head is not buried, the soil prevents chest expansion. The worker becomes immobilized by the soil's suction effect. Introduction. Cave-ins are much more likely to result in worker fatalities than other excavation-related accidents. 90% of all violations related to lack of cave-in protection involve manhole installations. During inspections where these violations were cited, the excavations were nearly vertical. Excavation and Trenching Plan Excavation and Trenching Plan and or hazard activity analysis will be prepared by the competent person for excavation or a registered professional engineer submitted and accepted by the government designated authority prior to beginning operations. Site conditions. Excavation and trenches less than five feet in depth and AHA is required, but the plan is optional. Excavations or trenches greater than five feet in depth and AHA and plan are required. Excavation and trenching activity hazard analysis. The activity hazard analysis shall include required information per section one and for all piping activities, Include workers' increased exposure during connection activities, i.e. bent over or kneeling. Methods and locations for egress. Identification and credentials of the competent person for excavation. And documentation that examination of the ground by the competent person provides no indication of potential cave-in. Excavation and trenching plan contents will include an activity hazard analysis a rescue plan and procedures, which is mandatory at depths greater than five feet, a diagram or sketch of the area where work to be done, indicating adjacent structures, projected maximum depth of excavation, projected soil type and method of testing, planned method of shoring, sloping, and or benching, planned method of confined space entry, access, egress, an atmospheric monitoring process, 
the location of utility shutoffs if required, proposed method for preventing overhead utility line damage, trees to remain or other features to remain, management of excavated soil, asphalt, or concrete, a traffic control plan, digging permits or excavation permits, unexploded ordnance clearance certificate, for coffer dams, controlled flooding plan, fall protection, access egress, and excavation procedures. It's an example of a fatal mishap that occurred during trenching. The trench was seven feet deep and four feet wide. The backhoe was 30 feet away and straddling the trench. The operator saw the walls collapse, there was no protective system installed, and the worker died as a result. Excavation testing and documentation. When workers will be in and around an excavation, a competent person for excavation shall inspect the excavation, the adjacent areas, and protective systems daily. Excavation inspections. A competent person shall inspect before each shift, throughout the work shift, after every rainstorm or other hazard increasing occurrence, when fissures, tension cracks, sloughing, undercutting, water seepage, bulging at the bottom or other similar condition occurs, when there is a change in the size, location, or placement of the spoil pile, and where there is any indication of change in adjacent structures. Some definitions. A competent person for excavations is designated in writing by the employer to be responsible for the immediate supervision, implementation, and monitoring of the excavation trenching program. They shall have appropriate training, experience, and knowledge. They are capable of identifying, evaluating, and addressing existing and potential hazards. They have the authority to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate existing and predictable hazards and to stop work when required. Excavation inspections. When persons for the purpose of inspecting, testing will be in or around an excavation that is deeper than six feet, but less than 20 feet, or that contains hazards, for example, impalement hazards or hazardous substances, they shall be provided with fall protection per section 21. An exception is the competent person for excavation may exempt the use of fall protection for inspectors or supervisors provided those individuals are not exposed to hazards within 24 inches of the edges, the excavation contains no additional hazards, and the individuals stay a minimum of 24 inches from the excavation edge. Testing of soil classification shall be of an approved method, i.e. pocket penetrometer, plasticity or wet thread test, or a visual test. Testing shall be conducted at a minimum of once prior to the start of each work shift or if conditions warrant. All testing for soil classification shall be determined by the competent person and documented. For example, QC daily reports or the excavation inspection log or other ways. Soil classification, 29 CFR 1926 Appendix A. The visual test. Observe the soil as it is excavated. Soil that remains in clumps when excavated is cohesive. Soil that breaks up easily and does not stay in clumps is granular. Manual test. Penetrometer, shear vein, plasticity, dry strength, and thumb penetration. Soil types. Type A, the most stable, dense and heavy clay. Type B, silt, sandy loam, or medium clay. Type C, the least stable, gravel, loamy sand, or soft clay. Excavation inspections. If evidence of a situation that could result in possible cave-ins, slides, failure of protective systems, hazardous atmospheres, or other hazardous conditions is identified, exposed workers shall be removed from the hazard and all work in the excavation stopped until all necessary safety precautions have been implemented. In locations where oxygen deficiency or gaseous conditions are known or suspected, in excavations four feet or greater in depth, 
Air in the excavation shall be tested prior to the start of each shift and more often if directed by the government designated authority. A log of all test results shall be maintained at the worksite. Protective systems. Protective systems shall have the capacity to resist without failure all loads that are intended or could reasonably be expected to be applied or transmitted to the system. Requirements for protective systems. The sides of all excavations in which employees are exposed to danger from moving ground shall be guarded by a support system, sloping or benching of the ground, or other equivalent means. Provide full worker protection from cave-ins except excavations in completely stable rock or less than five feet in depth and which a competent person examines, determines, and documents there is no potential for cave-ins. Protective systems shall have the capacity to resist without failure all loads that are intended or could reasonably be expected to be applied to the system. Shoring shall be used for unstable soil or depths greater than five feet unless benching, sloping, or other acceptable plan is implemented by the contractor and accepted by the government designated authority. Stability of adjacent structures. Except in stable rock, excavations below the level of the base of footing of any foundation or retaining wall shall not be permitted unless a support structure such as underpinning is provided or a registered professional engineer has approved the excavation trenching plan and determined that the structure will be unaffected by the excavation. If the stability of adjoining buildings or walls is endangered by excavations, shoring, bracing, or underpinning designed by a qualified person shall be provided to ensure the stability of the structure and to protect the employees. Sidewalks, pavements, and the related structures shall not be undermined unless a support system is provided to protect employees and the sidewalk, pavement, or related structure. Protection from water. Diversion ditches, dikes, or other means shall be used to prevent surface water entering an excavation and to provide good drainage of the area adjacent to the excavation. A competent person must monitor the control measures. Employees shall not work in excavations in which there is accumulated water or in which water is accumulating unless the water hazard posed by the accumulation is controlled. Protection from water. Freezing, pumping, draining, and similar control measures shall be planned and directed by a registered professional engineer. When continuous operation of groundwater control equipment is necessary, an emergency power source shall be provided. It shall be monitored by the competent person to ensure proper operation. Falling soil or equipment. Protect workers from loose rock soil that may fall from an excavation face. Use scaling to remove loose soil. Use protective barricades such as shoring or shields. Protect workers from material or equipment that could fall into the excavation. Keep material and equipment at least two feet from the edge. Use retaining devices. Mobile equipment and motor vehicle precautions. When vehicles or mobile equipment are used or allowed adjacent to an excavation, stop logs or barricades shall be installed. The use of a ground guide is recommended. Workers shall stand away from vehicles being loaded or unloaded to avoid being struck by spillage or falling materials. Excavating or hoisting equipment shall not be allowed to raise, lower, or swing loads over or adjacent to personnel in the excavation without substantial overhead protection. Personnel shall maintain a safe distance from hoisting operations until the load has been placed. Note, any equipment used to hoist loads with the use of rigging attachment to the equipment shall be considered load handling equipment or hoisting equipment and as such shall follow the requirements in Section 16. 
Employees exposed to public vehicular traffic shall be provided with and shall wear high visibility apparel as per section 05F. Working in the excavation. Employees shall not be permitted to work on the faces of sloped or benched excavations at levels above other employees except when employees on lower levels are adequately protected from the hazard of falling material or equipment. Underground Utilities When operations approach the location of underground utilities, excavation shall progress with caution until the exact location of the utility is determined. Workers shall be protected from the utility and the utility shall be protected from damage or displacement. Confined Spaces Employees entering excavations classified as confined spaces or that otherwise present the potential for emergency rescue shall wear rescue equipment and maintain communication with the attendant. Safe Access Protection shall be provided to prevent personnel, vehicles, and equipment from falling into excavations. Perimeter protection shall be provided according to the following hierarchy, Class 1, Class 2, or Class 3. Class 1 Perimeter Protection Guarding against personnel falling into an excavation shall meet the requirements of a standard guardrail for fall protection. Guarding against traffic, vehicles, and or equipment falling into an excavation shall be designed by a qualified person to withstand the potential forces and bending moments due to the impact by traffic. Class 1 Perimeter Protection is required when the excavation is exposed to members of the public or vehicles or equipment. Class 2 Perimeter Protection consists of warning barricades or flagging placed at a distance not closer than six feet from the edge of the excavation. Warning barricades or flagging do not have to meet the requirements for Class 1 Perimeter Protection but do need to display an adequate warning at an elevation of three feet to four feet above ground level. Class two perimeter protection is the minimum protection required if the excavation does not meet the requirements for class one perimeter protection, but is routinely exposed to employees deeper than six feet or contains hazards. When workers are in the zone between warning barricades or flagging and the excavation, they shall be provided with fall protection as specified in Section 21. Class 3 Perimeter Protection Warning barricades or flagging placed at a distance not closer than 6 inches nor more than 6 feet from the edge of the excavation. Warning barricades or flagging do not have to meet the requirements for Class 1 Perimeter Protection but do need to display an adequate warning at an elevation of three feet to four feet above ground level. If the excavation does not meet the requirements for either class one or class two perimeter protection, then class three perimeter protection is the minimum protection required. Rescue plan and procedures. The employer is required to provide prompt rescue to all buried workers. A written rescue plan shall be prepared by the competent person or a registered professional engineer submitted and accepted by the government designated authority prior to beginning operations and maintained when workers are working at depths over five feet. The plan shall contain provisions for self-rescue and assisted rescue, including rescue equipment. If other methods of rescue are planned, it shall be indicated in the rescue plan, including how to contact and summon the agency to the mishap site. Personnel conducting rescue shall be trained accordingly. Safe access. All wells, calyx holes, pits, shafts, etc. shall be barricaded and covered. Excavations shall be backfilled as soon as possible. Upon completion of exploration and similar operations, test pits, temporary wells, calyx holes, etc. shall be backfilled immediately. Walkways or bridges shall be provided with standard guardrails where people or equipment are required or permitted to cross over excavations. 
stairway, ladder, ramp, or other safe means of egress shall be located in trench excavations that are four feet or more in depth to require no more than 25 feet of lateral travel for employees. At least two means of exit shall be provided for personnel working in excavations. The width of the excavation exceeds 100 feet, two or more means of exit for each side. Excavations 20 feet or more in depth, ramps, stairs, or mechanical personnel hoists. Ramps. Ramps solely for personnel access shall be a minimum width of four feet and provided with standard guardrails. Ramps for equipment shall be 12 foot minimum width. Ladders used as access ways shall extend from the bottom of the excavation to not less than three feet above the surface. The picture shows these two ladders which are lashed together are not an adequate means of egress. Sloping and benching. Excavations less than 20 feet deep, maximum slope shall be 34 degrees measured from the horizontal. For example, a one and a half foot horizontal run to a one foot vertical run. Maximum allowable slopes and allowable configurations for sloping and benching systems shall be determined in accordance with the conditions and requirements set forth in 29 CFR 1926 Subpart P, Appendices A and B. Design selected from tabulated data, OSHA standard, or the manufacturer's specification. Designed or approved by a registered professional engineer. Sloping is the angling of walls at an incline. Benching is a series of steps to angle the walls. Soil type determines the angle of the slope or the bench. Type A. 3 foot horizontal to a 4 foot vertical, 3 quarters to 1. Type B, 4 foot horizontal to a 4 foot vertical, a 1 to 1 slope. Type C, 6 foot horizontal to 4 foot vertical, a 1 and a half to 1 slope. Benching is not permitted for type C soil. Support systems. Timber, hydraulic, and mechanical shoring systems, etc. Designs are drawn from the manufacturer's tabulated data. From the tabulated data, such as tables and charts, such as OSHA standard. Designed or approved by a registered professional engineer. A copy of either the manufacturer's tabulated data, other tabulated data, or designed by the registered professional engineer must be in written form and maintained on the job site during the excavation. Requirements for support systems. Materials for protective systems shall be free from damage and defects, used according to the manufacturer's specifications. If damaged, the competent person must determine the suitability for continued use. Installation and removal of support systems. The support system members must be securely connected together. They must be installed and removed to ensure employee safety and support systems not subject to loads exceeding their capacity. Removal of support systems. Removal of support systems shall begin from the bottom of the excavation. Members shall be released slowly as to note any indication of possible failure of the remaining members or possible cave-in of the sides of the excavation. Backfilling progresses with the removal of shoring. Requirements for trenching. Excavation material shall be permitted to a level not greater than two feet below the bottom of the members of a support system only if the system is designed for support of full depth and there is no evidence of soil loss behind or below the support system. Shield systems. Shield systems shall not be subjected to loads exceeding those that the system was designed to withstand. Shields shall be installed in a manner to resist lateral or other hazardous movement of the shield in the event of the application of sudden lateral loads. Employees shall be protected from the hazard of cave-ins when entering or exiting the area protected by the shields. Employees shall not be allowed in shields when shields are being installed, 
removed, or moved vertically. Hydraulic trench support. Using hydraulic jacks, the operator can easily drop the system into the hole. Once in place, hydraulic pressure is increased to keep the forms in place. Trench pins are installed in case of hydraulic failure. Materials and equipment. Equipment used for protective systems must not have damage or defects that impair their function. If equipment is damaged, the competent person must examine it to see if it is suitable for continued use. If not suitable, remove it from service until a professional engineer approves it for use. Coffer dams. If overtopping of the coffer dam by high water is possible, design shall include provisions for controlled flooding of the work area. If personnel or equipment are required or permitted on coffer dams, standard railings or equivalent protection shall be provided. Walkways, bridges, or ramps with at least two means of rapid exit with standard guardrails shall be provided for personnel and equipment working on coffer dams. A plan for evacuating personnel and equipment in case of emergency and for controlling flooding shall be developed and posted. Coffer dams located close to navigable shipping channels shall be protected from vessels in transit. Excavation Summary Remove all surface encumbrances. Determine location of all underground utilities before opening the excavation. Use safe means to determine exact location and protect underground utilities. And if required, obtain a digging permit. Tone before you dig. Get a dig permit where applicable. Classify soil and install proper protection prior to entry of trench or excavation. Provide fall protection for employees exposed to falls of six feet or greater. Provide members of the public protection.